Good morning, everyone. This is Vincent Thiel from HTTP Test here. I'm still in Rome on the final day of the IFA 2018 Global Press Conference, and I'm joined beside me by Mr. Paul Gray, who is the Research Director at IHS Market. He has an encyclopedic knowledge of the TV industry. Thanks, Paul, for taking the time to join us on this glorious morning. Uh, morning, Vincent. It's really good to be here, and it's good to be back talking to you again. Now, Sharp has actually launched its first 8K TV slash monitor for the European market at this event. And I think some questions on our viewers' minds are that, is it too early? Where is the 8K content coming from? Can you give some comments on that? Yeah, very, very good questions, which is essentially, why do I want to buy one of these things now? And it is an early product. It's uh, Somebody has to be first, of course. and. Uh, um, uh, always, I think, being first people then say, why, why, why do this and why do it now? Um, but content is absolutely the question. From a Japanese point of view, then NHK in Japan has committed very publicly to launch an 8K channel on the 1st of December this year. And when they mean an 8K channel, that is not a loop. It's not a test channel. That's 8K, six hours a day at least, of new content every day for uh, for the f for the future. Okay, another key question that a lot of people will be asking is whether eight K makes sense in your normal living room, whether the increase in resolution can be perceived from normal viewing distance. Do you have any words to say on that? Uh, it, it it's an important one, and and with an eight K screen, then. If it's uh, the sort of screens that most people have in the living rooms, you have to sit awfully close to it. And, and broadcaster's rule of thumb is that it has to be within uh, three quarters of the height of the screen, uh, which either means you sit very close to it or you have a very big screen. Uh, and 8K is really not like TV as we've known it. Um, it is so rich, there's so much detail, but it's more like IMAX at home. <laughs> Um, and, and if you think about how an IMAX cinema, or if, uh, if you've ever been to one, is it fills your whole field of vision um, and you, you don't really notice that you're in a cinema, it's just all screen. And I think that's really what 8K um, should feel like at home. And if the starting size for 4K is 40 inch, then the starting size for 8K, well, we're getting on towards 80 inch, you know, and... Uh, Certainly, I think a 70-inch class um, screen is, is the sort of place to start. Definitely. And I think trying to fit a 70-inch screen in your typical European or British home is going to be quite a struggle. When do you really see 8K being mainstream? Uh, mainstream's a long way away. Um, it, for, for the foreseeable future, then it's going to be a treat. Just because of the, the sheer bulk and the screen size. Um, there's some teases for the far future about maybe a rollable screen and, and something like that. that that's a, still a science project. Um, but screen sizes have been growing by one inch a year, every year for more than 10 years, um, both in uh, Britain or elsewhere in Europe, but also in the US or China or Japan or anywhere. Um, people are at different sizes on stages on that, but that, that one inch a year is still very reliable. Um, the BBC and NHK thought up 8K some years ago, and their technology planning said you'd change the broadcast once a generation, so let's say every 25 to 30 years. And they really planned that 8K would... Um, begin to acquire momentum from 2025, 2030 onwards. But of course, just like HD, then there were a lot of um, trials before that, early products. And Japan, for example, had an analog HD system in the early 1990s. At that stage, it felt like a science project. Um, and we were talking about 28 and 32 inch CRTs and they felt huge at the time. Um, so, you know, screen growth will will get there. It's very early, but these are the sort of products that lay down and pave the way towards uh, media consumption in the future. Okay, moving on to another topic, TCL at this 
global press conference also unveiled their roadmap for the foreseeable future. And one of their key focus is quantum dot technology. Can you explain to our viewers the differences between different quantum dot technologies, let's say quantum dot film, quantum dot on glass, quantum dot color filter, and eventually self-emissive quantum dot technology? Uh, I'll try and do it without a diagram. Uh, normally at this stage, I'd, I'd like to draw pictures. Um, so a conventional TV as we have at the moment uses blue LEDs in the backlight. They then hit the quantum dot film, which is a plastic film with dots in it. And that then converts some of the blue light to green and red. And as a result, you get white light. Um, the problem is that that is an expensive film to make. Um, quantum dots have to be uh, protected in various ways from chemical contaminants, which will poison them. Um, and the, the idea is that instead of adding a, an extra optical sheet of plastic with the quantum dots in it, instead you, you have it as a, a resin and you can then coat uh, the light guide plate in the, back, uh, in the backlight with the resin. Um, so rather than have a sheet, you can uh, put crudely paint on <laughs> the resin you use a coating process um, which should be cheaper um, and is a different way of doing it the problem with LCD is that only about one four percent of the light actually that's in the backlight comes through to you and your eye and so the idea that uh, Samsung had with quantum dot and the color filter is that you just have the uh, color conversion at the end that makes the system more transparent. Um, and you're just switching blue light from the blue backlight at the end, at the back, through the L LCD switch, and then you convert it at the front. And all the light that goes through is then uh, seen. And you would see a big improvement in efficiency. It's complicated. Um, one of the things being that the quantum dots emit in all directions, but the biggest one is that you have to convert absolutely all the light from blue to green or red. Mm -hmm. um, and getting a 100% conversion is difficult. If you don't, then you get uh, color impurity. The next stage on from that is that quantum dots are an energy conversion um, substance. And what you can do with quantum dots is you could use them as the emitting um, source for an emissive display like an OLED. So it wouldn't be a, an organic LED, it would be an inorganic LED. And you could either make a blue LED with the quantum dot material on top um, for, for red and green, or you could actually just drive the quantum dot directly by putting electricity into it and you get colored light out. Um, these things are in the lab. People are working on them very seriously. Uh, we know that Samsung is working on that emissive quantum dot technology. Um, and TCL stated very clearly yesterday that uh, that was on their roadmap as well and uh, is something that they are investing a large amount of money in. Okay. So currently we have quantum dot on film. And when can we expect, first of all, quantum dot on glass? quantum dot color filter and self-emissive quantum dot technology. Obviously, it's not going to be easy doing this forecasting, especially <laughs> on camera. Yeah. But can you give us some ballpark number of years that you yeah. think this will be available to buy on the market? Uh, we had heard that there was a possibility of somebody launching a quantum dot on glass. So just the resin uh, based solution at CES um, at the beginning of this year. That didn't happen, but I think it looks likely that people will launch some. Somebody will launch that later this year. Um, as I see it, that's primarily a cost um, innovation on on quantum dot, and, and that's interesting. Um, going to the end point of um, an emissive quantum dot technology, I think we're looking in the early twenty twenties. Um, it's very difficult to. Um, predict an innovation rate um, because obviously this is a development project and nobody knows what all the problems will be and nobody knows what the solutions are to those problems. Um, but I think early 2020s. And the quantum dot color filter, I think, is an interesting one that 
it's um, it's an intermediate step, um, and we had uh, believed that Samsung was going to do that, probably for launch 2019, 2020. Um, there's been a lot of talk in Korea that they're going to skip that step. So that's it's just too much and too busy, and they don't see it as an endpoint. So maybe they're 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 not going to do it, but we will see. Okay. Talking about Samsung, at CES, the South Korean brand also unveiled its 146-inch The Wall, which is based on micro-LED technology, which is 4K in resolution. In my mind, that is only a statement product that is not really viable anywhere in the near future. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, Vincent. If, if you count up the number of LEDs in that, um, then there's... Um, such a such a large quantity that even if you have a a six sigma manufacturing process, which is best in class worldwide, that's where everybody aims to get to. Um, then even at that level, you will have a hundred defects on the screen. Um, so you have to have a parts per billion um, quality process. If you if you're not having rejects in the parts per billion then this is not a, a manufacturable product and nobody's in a parts per billion. The other one is that a good pick and place machine, you know, a world-class one, um, does 300,000 placements an hour and with over the order of uh, 30 million uh, LEDs to place, then it's going to take a long time to make each one. Uh, the story was that uh, Sony's Crystal LED, which was a similar um, concept, it became much smaller, but again, lots and lots of LEDs placed individually, took three months to make. Just three months, da 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 da, da, da placing those LEDs. And, and that's the scale of the, um, of, of the task. Um, of course, people make video walls, um, and in, in relatively large numbers, we see them in, elsewhere, but the resolutions are lower and they are still expensive things to make. Now, currently, the TV market, especially at the high end, is being led by OLED technology, which is also self-emissive and it gives many of the very desirable properties of very high contrast, uh, colors, white viewing angles and other things like that. What are some of the current limitations you see with OLED technology and where do you foresee research going into for, let's say, the next few years? Yeah, the, I, I think the, the issue with OLED is, um, is manufacturing. Um, any emissive display, by, by definition, has issues of burn-in and things like that um, because different parts of the display are, um, will wear out at different rates, and that's what burn-in is. Um, the the main goal in OLED is at the moment it's a hot process when you make it. Um, it's vacuum deposition, and the the holy grail, if you like, of all display making is that you print them. Um, there are now soluble materials, which means that you can print them in red and green. Um, OLED makers have a choice at the moment as to whether you run this mixed hot and cold process. Um, and many say that's too complex. But where we're aiming to go with uh, with OLED is towards a printable process. Um, there are companies investing in making inkjet printers specifically for making displays. Um, and, and we will see inkjet printed ones, I think, within the next five years. Eventually beyond inkjet printing, then you could get to roll-to-roll -to -roll printing where you, you print it like you do magazines or newspapers. Um, and that would be truly transformative on cost. Um, and that is where the, the main line of investment is, which is changing the process from a hot uh, conventional one to a cold printing-like process. And another, how should I say it, burning question on people's mind is that currently the white OLED manufacturing process by LG Display can only yield screen sizes of 55 inches and beyond. Yeah. And I think many of our readers really want the self-emissive technology 
to exist in smaller screen yeah. sizes. Would you care to comment on that? You're right that people uh, want that. I, I, I think that um, it's always an interesting question. Actually, if you made 32-inch OLED, um, your yields would be much higher. However, how many people would want to spend a thousand pounds or a thousand euros on a 32-inch TV? And the answer is probably not many. Um, so OLED has to fit in with the cost structure of the rest of the industry, the price structure, and otherwise consumers will just go, you know, this this doesn't really quite fit. Um, certainly, that if you look at LG's next fab, which is a generation 8.5 fab, 48-inch. Um, would be an efficient size to make, bear in mind how you cut the glass up. Um, and it's then a commercial decision about what price you would have to sell to be profitable and whether that's an attractive one to consumers. So I don't know whether they'll make 48 inch. Remember that's in a couple of years time. And even this year in Europe, then 55 will outsell 32 inch. Um, and most consumers are still prepared to move more furniture to put a bigger screen in. To me, that's really an astonishing stat. 55-inch yes. outselling 32-inch TVs at the end of this quarter. Is that right? Uh, at, at the last quarter this year. At the last quarter, yeah, year. Uh, yes. And one final thing then. I think at the higher end of the market today, there's intense competition between full array local dimming LED LCD yeah. and OLED. Where do you see that playing out and whether you can see full array local dimming LED LCD competing on an equal level playing field. Again, the cost is going to be the issue here, isn't it? And if you can give us some thoughts on that, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, I think the first one is, um, and you know, my advice to any consumer is, buy what you like. Uh, if you can't see the difference, don't pay for the difference. Um, and try and assess it in as, as close to your own viewing conditions uh, as possible. Um, me speaking personally, then I think that um, full array local dimming LCD done well, you know, really, really thoroughly executed design is absolutely as competitive as OLED. Um, if you like watching movies in the dark in a cinema-like condition, then you'll enjoy the black levels from OLED. Um, if you watch in a more brightly lit room, um, then the extra brightness of the LCD could be the thing that makes it far more watchable and you don't see the shadow detail anyway um, because you've got other reflections and, for example, of screen and glare in the room. Um, so buy what you like um, and don't go and buy a technology. You, you're not, you're not, you don't watch a technology, you watch programming and content and you want to watch the thing that brings that content to life. Thank you, Paul. I think uh, our conversation has been extremely illuminating, not only for myself, but also for our viewers. Thank you, Paul. Uh, have a safe flight back to Britain, and I'll see you at the next event. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Absolute pleasure. Bye.